Good evening and welcome to El Oso Fumar Takes. This is our 81st take live from Euless, Texas. I'm Barry Duplissy, your host as always, and I'm so proud, so privileged, and so tired, but yet still awake from this year's IPCPR trade show. I am back and I am so pleased to bring you our 81st take. And I am so excited to have our guest this evening who I'll be introducing in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but be before I get to him, we do have to thank the people that make this show possible. And of course, those people are our sponsors. And this show of course is sponsored by Drew Estate. Drew Estate celebrate, celebrates the 20th anniversary of the Acid Cigar brand this year with the national release of Acid 20, a cigar displayed at this past week's IPCPR convention and trade show held last week in Las Vegas. President Jonathan Drew of Drew Estate exclaims, the Acid Cigar brand was born under the Manhattan Bridge on the Brooklyn side, of course, with a raw and honest vision of boundless freedom. Urban culture and massive style supercharged the Acid brand, shaking the foundation of the traditional cigar empires across the globe. Acid's impact was much more than just disruptive as it essentially cracked the mainframe of the sl sleepy status quo. Over 20 years, we transformed from a scrappy little crew on J Street in Brooklyn to an organized viral network of distinct distinguished diplomats rocking every street in America. Acid is everywhere, like Savoy Fair, percolating, and uh, and with reconnaissance. So that is thanks to our sponsor, Drew Estate. And if you guys are watching us on YouTube, we really appreciate it. Always appreciate the live audience. So thank you guys for tuning in. Really excited about this. But if you listen are listening later, wherever you can listen to podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, Podbeam, Spotify, tune in, wherever you download podcasts. You are listening to Elos Fumar Takes exclusively because of Cornelius and Anthony Premium Cigars. Cornelius and Anthony Premium Cigars is steeped in tobacco tradition. For over 150 years, the Bailey family has been part of America's tobacco heritage, passionately caring for the land they cultivate in Keysville, Virginia. Cornelius and Anthony's devotion to the finest grown tobacco and four most aspects of craftsmanship allows us to allows them to introduce the most exquisite cigars to the market. They invite you to enjoy their po their portfolio of premium hand rolled cigars and experience their dedication to it producing an exceptional product. So we really appreciate our sponsors for tonight's show and most of all we appreciate our tremendous guest who is joining me right now and I am so excited, so pleased and so honored to welcome in Mr. Benjamin Holt of Dissident Cigars. Ben how are we doing tonight? Doing really good, man. Enjoying uh, recouping a little bit from the trade show and uh, sitting down uh, over at my, 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 my sister's house in Weatherford, Texas. Finally made it back to Texas after a long journey. Um, but yeah, doing fantastic, man. I, uh, I I remarked it when we got on before the show. I, I didn't know how you actually were still awake. So I was, I was really <laughs> pleased that you were able to make the show. So um, how, so how, so what, just uh, tackle the the uh, the easy target in the room here, Ben. How was the show for you? It was phenomenal, man. I was really humbled, and and just everybody that came out, uh, the accounts that we opened, and we're still growing. Uh, what we, the the amount of product that we sold, just just the the warm welcome that I got from you know not just from retailers and and consumers alike, but um, you know other other manufacturers, other brands. Um, it was, it was really a, a, it was, it was a great launch of it. Well, it, it was probably, you know, it probably brought a lot of back, a lot of memories for some folks, because at one point or another, most brands were in the shoes you're in now, you know, just starting out and getting started, getting the ball rolling, you know, um, you know, some with little to no acclaim, some with, you know, a lot of acclaim, but you know, they were all in your shoes at one point. So that probably bat, brought back some sentimental memories for them. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, did anyone and did anyone share any stories about their first shows that kind of gave you hope, inspiration, or just was memorable to you? Yeah, I think there were some people that were really, you know, really uh, impressed and and gave me a lot of congratulations on how many accounts I did open up, you know, compared to their first show. And um, um, I think just uh, they, you know, a lot of them just gave me a lot of props for you know saying I did it right. You know, I, I took it slow. You know, I, I did I got my experience first and foremost in the industry as a as working retail and then then doing the rep thing and then you know taking it to the next level um so well this this was exciting for me ben because I, I i told you i was going to tell you something on, on on the show and everything so i i wanted um when you first uh you first told me that you were buying the company buying dissident and uh 
and everything. I, I told you, I said, I, have, I want you on the show. And this was the, this was the show. This was the spot that I wanted you on. I wanted you for the show right after the trade show, if at all possible. Um, and, uh, and luckily you, you, uh, you agreed and you were available. So I, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to play any cards. I didn't want to play any pity. I didn't, you know, say, Hey, I have this great plan or anything like that, <laughs> but this is the show that I wanted you for. And so I'm, I'm really glad that I got to, to get to have you on for this specific spot because, um, you know, after the, you know, after the trade show there, there's, there's so much information. There's so much product out there. A lot of things are getting released and there's a lot of excitement in the air, uh, for the consumer, uh, and for the retail and everything. And that's why I particularly wanted to have you in this spot because it was going to be completely fresh off of your first trade show. And, uh, you'd kind of, you'd been, you would have done it, been doing this for a couple of months and you, but this was kind of, this was kind of the grand launch, right? This was, yeah. this, you yeah. know, this was everything kind of everything, all the hard work and everything the last few months has been kind of building toward this head. So was it anything like you expected? Was it, was it, was it bigger? Was it, you know, what, you know, how did it, uh, how did it coincide with your, uh, your expectations? Well, I kind of kept my expectations a little low, but, um, you know, going into it because, you know, I, I didn't really know what to expect. You know, they heard all the scuttlebutt on everything that was going to go around the show and, you know, attendance and all those kind of things, you know, plagued the mind. But um, we hit I had I had a kind of a safety net kind of idea, you know, my expect my low expectation and then um, kind of a, a little goal I wanted to hit. And I hit it. Um, I hit the goal and right on, you know, pretty much almost right on the money. So, uh, it, it was in my, in my perspective, it was, it was phenomenal. It was, it was great. It was everything at, and a little bit more than what I expected. That's really, that's really great to hear. Cause there were, I mean, there were, there were a lot of, uh, there were, I would say that there's a lot of, there were a lot of mixed messages at the show from specific retailers and from also from manufacturers and owners too. There was kind of a lot of mixed messaging. Some were having great shows. Some were kind of, uh, being really, we're, we're really disappointed. So it's really exciting for you, uh, having this kind of being the launching pad for which you're willing to build this brand to have, uh, to have it, uh, start off in such a, with such positive momentum. But I do want to go back a little bit, Ben, cause I want, just want to kind of start to where this all kind of started. Cause we're kind of picking up in the middle of the conversation yeah. a little bit. Um, so I, uh, I, as I mentioned before the show, you, you posted on social media recently uh, a photo of you and Derek, who's the national sales manager of uh, Black Label, uh, Black Works, and Emilio Cigars, a guy you've known for a really long time. Uh, in fact, you guys started in the business together working at a cigar shop uh, in McGregor, Texas. And uh, and it was a really, really good moment. You know, just a, a little snapshot of, of, of you two now, where you are now. And it it's really awesome because of where you guys, where you guys started. Talk a little bit about what that moment meant to you. Again, it was just a snapshot. You didn't even realize the photo had been taken at the moment, but I'm sure it gave you pause for great reflection when you saw it later. What, you know, when you, when you started, tell us about when you started and, and, and how it's kind of come up to where you are now. Yeah. So, um, I got out, I had gotten out of the Marine Corps had moved to Texas, was going to college. And on my way to class, um, you know, I was a cigar smoker. I enjoyed cigars. So on my way to class every day, um, I would pass up TJ Cigar Lounge in McGregor, Texas. And I would stop in, pick up some smokes to enjoy. And I saw they had a help wanted sign. Um, and I thought, well, this would be a good part-time gig for me, you know, for the weekend. And I uh, just, you know, went in and filled out an application and decided to grow my my knowledge, uh, on, on the industry. And that's where I met Derek Matthews. Um, you know, he's a, he works for the VA. He's a, he's a full-time social worker for the veterans administration down in central Texas. And he just worked there, you know, a couple, you know, part-time a couple days a week as well too. Um, and he was just a cigar nerd and I just picked his brain on so many things about cigars and tobacco and, and the brands and learning stories. And I learned a lot from him on, on that. And, uh, then not too long after I joined Black Label and not too long after that, he came on board the Black Label as national sales manager. So we were both, you know, on the same team again and uh, we've been working with each other ever since. And um, I mean, it's been a long road, you know, I, I think that's, you know, when that, when that moment was captured, we were going to dinner and me and Derek were walking in front of James and Angela and it was Angela that took the picture. And, you know, me and, me and him just put our arms around each other and, you know, we were just really impressed with how the show went. and. In all regards of all the with the Van Negra brands, 
because like I said, the past six months has been grueling work for us. Um, and it, we hit it out of the park and we just kind of were reveling in that moment a little bit, I think, and appreciating and, and understanding like that the, all the hard work was for something, you know, it, it, it didn't go to waste it, it, we, like I said, we hit it out of the, we hit it out of the park and, um, it was just really awesome that Angela be able, was able to catch that moment, you know, um, no, we'll be we'll be able to have that forever and look back on it. So, absolutely. And as I kind of mentioned, uh, you know, before the show, and I'm, you know, as our viewers and listeners know, I'm, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a sentimental guy, and so um, that 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 photo spoke to me, man. And that's why I brought it up because I just thought it was, you know, it was it was really touching. And so it was it was it was really great that that moment could be captured so that you could say so that as you said, you could look back on it for years to come, and know that all the hard work was for something. So going back to your days. You know, fresh out of the Marine Corps, you're 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 going in between classes, and then you're you know you're working part time at night in the cigar lounge. Did you ever imagine that you would build something from scratch in the manner in which you did with Dissident at this point? No, not at all. I mean, the idea with Dissident really came about a year ago. Um, I was sitting down in Nicaragua, um, and at the back of James's you know patio at his house, and I just brought up the idea. I'm like, what if I did this? You know. And him and Angela were really supportive from the go. They're like, yeah, man, we, you know, we can definitely do something with this. I think it would be, you know, it's just, it seems like it's just a natural process of things. And uh, so I started working on that and getting everything that we saw at the show. That was, even though, I, you know, I was, get, I was getting a lot of other things done beforehand, but pretty much come the new year to the show, that six months, that was a grind. That was a hustle. That was, you know, every day, you know, staying up late, making sure everything was on point and I was going by the plan and, and getting production going and, and bands is, and the bands and the boxes and all that stuff. Um, it took a lot of work, um, but I wanted to do it right. My whole idea with the launch of Dissident, I didn't want to, I didn't want to release one line and then months later you release another line. And, you know, if I was going to do it, I was going to do it right. And the trade show is a Super Bowl, right? So, you know, if you're going to do it, come with everything you've got, all your ammo and put it on the table and, and show it to the world. And uh, we were able to meet that, you know, so I was really, really thankful uh, for all the work that they've done at Obea Negra, you know, James and Angela uh, making, you know, working with me to make this happen. You know, it seemed, you know, when, when the purchase was first announced, Ben, I'm going to be honest, like, you know, it was kind of hard. And I, I had, I had conversations with a lot of different folks, you know, retailers, consumers, uh, cigar media and everything. And there was, you know, I, I think it was like kind of, you know, cautious positivity, like wanting the best for you, but we, we really didn't know how, you know, this could kind of work because in our head, at least I'm going to speak for myself here in my head, I had the previous dissident products, how they smoked their, you know, marketing and everything in my head. And I'm like, how does, how does Benjamin Holt fit into this picture? And you answered that question by saying, I don't. And you created something you took a name and, and you took a name and, and arguably some, you know, names of cigars, but you made it your own. You put your own signature on it along with the blends too, because they're completely different as well. Mm -hmm. Was that kind of the mindset going like going in like, Hey, okay, th this is where I want to go. Uh, and then I'm going to completely change everything. Was that part of it or does that, did that just come naturally? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that was part of it. Um, I like the foundation that they set, you know, I, I like, you know, the, the names and the imagery and, you know, the attitude that they brought to it, you know, and I don't think that um, it was given its just due in the, in the industry. Um, but of course, with anything I do, with anything that any of us, you know, any of us have, have ever done, we want to do it our way a little bit and put our spin on it. Um, so, you know, so box block home and there's some other stuff I want to do as well too. Um, I, I wanted to take that, you know, that message that dissident was and um, give it another kind of platform uh, to, to, to voice that message and, and to highlight, you know, different tobaccos that we, you know, we are able to use at Ovea Negra, some of the, you know, really great, and there are different blends than what, you know, uh, what they, we produce with Black Label, Black Works and Emilio, you know? Um, so I think adding that to the portfolio with Ovea Negra, you know, Black Label has a very distinct flavor, Ovea, uh, Black Works does and, and Emilio does and putting another kind of, uh, you know, flavor profile in there too shows that what, you know, the versatility and, and uh, what Ovea Negra can do. 
And, and that's exactly what I was just about to say to you, Ben, is that these these blends in particular um, are different than anything else that you've kind of seen come out of. Uh, like you could you could argue and kind of look at the marketing a little bit and kind of kind of see some correlation, but it's still unique enough. Uh, and I think I think it just screams you um, personally. Uh, but but the blends are something completely different too. And man, I'm I just lit up the home, um, and I'm smoking this. And man, the you know, I I, uh, I doubled down on the humidity, man. When you hand this to me at the show, I I, I threw in a couple extra Boveda packs. I was like, I want this thing primed and ready for the show on Sunday. Um, and uh, man, it is it is drawing beautifully. Um, the flavors on point has that it's. So this is a barber pole. I want to talk about the cigar for a little bit. So this is a limited edition, the Home 2019. I'm going to go and put it on the camera. It's a barber pole. So Ecuadorian Maduro and Corojo. Uh -huh. Um, and then the the Binder is um, Ecuadorian, as Ecuadorian. Well. but the story is the filler. Now, most people don't get too excited about filler tobacco in this industry, um, but I got excited about it because of, of the, the messaging behind it. So the filler is 100% Esteli Nicaraguan, um, and there's there's a reason that yes. you that you made that a part of this particular blend. Um, can you Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so when the first time I went down to Ovea Negra um, some years ago, like we I smoked through all the tobacco, and I've always loved Esteli tobacco, you know, especially Esteli Lajero. That's that's my jam. Um, and really getting to smoke all the tobaccos, I was just really gravitated towards those, you know, Esteli Lajero, Esteli Viso, Esteli Seco. Like it's, and there's other tobaccos that are grown there too, ASP as well. Um, so when I was thinking about, because you know, I'm, I'm working with, well, I'm working with some other names that other people had, you know, developed, and I was like, what does this mean to me? And the only thing I could think of when I thought about home was my first time going down there and how much I just loved SLE tobacco, and I wanted to highlight that, you know, because um, Ovea Negro became another home for me as well too, you know. So, and yeah, that's that's. I just wanted to take that stuff and highlight that tobacco and kind of share that. Uh, I like the dark fruit that comes off of Esteli. I like that spice uh, that comes off of Esteli Lajero. And, you know, I wanted to highlight that in the cigar. And and that's what I've kind of the approach I've taken with a lot of, you know, with all the lines is there's specific tobaccos I want to concentrate on and blend right that people can, when they smoke it, they can be able to develop their palates a little bit more and distinguish those flavors and that tobacco in them. What I what I really love about that story in particular, Ben, is that it, it is actually something that I just learned a few minutes ago. Um, as you as you said earlier, you actually told me for the show before the show started for the first time. You you were in the military, and yeah. not only that, you were part of a military family, so you moved around a lot. So, the name home to you is something entirely different than probably most other people. Yeah, um, yeah. Be, and uh, so it's it's interesting that you know a, a part of you that's been adopted by by the land of Nicaragua, uh, you know, became home for you and, and is, is the core part of, of this particular line. So really exciting, really exciting stuff, man. I'm really digging it. Um, Thank you. really, really, really digging it. Well done. Um, so to talk about these others, so you've got three, three lines that you've launched thus, thus far. We've mm -hmm. got the soapbox, the block, um, and the home, which is a limited release. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, you mentioned that you wanted to kind of start from scratch and kind of build these up as your own. What kind of, uh, obviously they're made at Oveja Negra, um, and, uh, which is run of course by James Brown and everything. But, uh, what, uh, process did you play in the blending of this, in the, the, the tasting of the product, the, you know, all the entire process where, uh, where were you when it, um, when it all came down to it on the factory floor, were you alongside James? How does that process work? I'm, I'm, I'm really interested. Well, this one, um, you know, when I told him I bought the brand, I've been smoking James tobacco for years, you know, and I've gone down there and, and learned and played with the tobacco. You know, I've made little cigars just for myself to come back with, you know, experimented with blends before. And so when I, was, when I was going down there, James was just kind of told me like, think about, you know, some blends you want to, you know, play around with and see what we can come up with. So I went down there with kind of this idea of what I wanted each one of them to be. And uh, so we're sitting there, we're, you know, we, and just like anything, you know, it was kind of a, it was a, it was a team effort really with me and him, you know, we sat down there with the blends I wanted, we smoked them out um, and kind of, 
okay, maybe we need to add this to it. Maybe we need to take away a little bit of this, you know. Um, and it was just, you know, two, just two minds really coming together and, and developing it. You know, as you said, you've known James for years and you've smoked his tobacco and you've loved his, you've loved his cigars for a long time, you know, not just as a person who wor who's worked for him, but just as, a, just as a smoker and just as a fan in general and everything. What was it like to actually get, get your hands dirty so to speak and really like realize when did it click for you that hey this this is going to be my cigar and people are going to be going into a shop buying my cigar and seeing the work that i'm doing with james brown and so like when did that when did you have an aha moment did it all click or was it has it all just been such a blur now there was an aha moment, um, you know, when I was down there doing it and I was, I think I was a little bit more focused just, you know, getting things done, you know, going by like my itinerary or what I wanted to accomplish when I was down there. And I think uh, really when it really was that aha moment was uh, when, you know, James, when I went down there in April, I went down there in April to check the production and stuff and look at the boxes and seeing my cigars in the aging room resting that was that was the moment then i'm like this is you know this is my creation this oh, is oh damn this is about to happen <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly like this you know there's no turning back like this is this is this is happening the train is is moving that's really fantastic the uh, the home right now smoke the home kind of reminds me it's kind of taking me back a little bit in a different direction because i remember smoking a lot of the block toros the original block toros and um of course the blend's completely different than the home um, tastes completely different, but the, the feel of the box press, the fact that we're talking about, it, it's kind of taking me back to those times that I had the, the block actually. So, um, and that draw is actually incredibly similar everything. Just to go back one more, one more moment here, Ben, if we can kind of go down memory lane a little bit, what, were you looking at any other brands to start? Is there, was there something specific that spoke to you about dissident, you know, that, you know, did it, or, you know, or is it just one of those things that all the cards fell into place and this, this was the only one, this was it. And it just happened to fit you perfectly. Uh, I mean, I think if one it was, it was, it was my number one brand I wanted to go for. There were some other ones I thought about doing, you know, pursuing and stuff like that. Um, but dissident was, that was the one, uh, it, it did speak to me. I, I like the name. I like what they were doing before. Like I said, the foundation that they laid, um, I think, you know, especially in this time in the industry, and it's kind of how my personality is. And when I grew up, you know, I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s. You know, it was into the Cold War. It was kind of some, it was, you know, a little bit of crazy times a little bit at mm -hmm. that time, right? Um, that's why, you know, I kind of highlighted that on, on the imagery of a block, you know, tearing down the Berlin Wall. I remember that, you know, very vividly. And, for you know, for Generation Xers, just, you know, people of my age and that age group, you know, I wanted to make something for them, something that, they, you know, they can smoke and, and enjoy and just feel kind of a part of as well too, you know? Um, and this is, this doesn't take away from any of the other brands out there, you know, but I'm not, you know, I, I don't have Cuban background. I'm, you know, my family was, uh, immigrants from Europe. Um, just like many other Americans here. Um, you know, I don't have a, a crazy pedigree. I come from in the tobacco world. And I think that's a lot of people out there in, 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 you know, that, are, that enjoy cigars that are the same way. So I kind of just wanted to make something for them a little bit, you know? Um, yeah. You know. No, I, I think that that's, uh, I think that's what makes this, this story incredibly unique is the fact that, you know, it is, it is completely different now. No, you're not, you're certainly not the first person to, you know, you're firstly, certainly not the first non-Cuban to start a cigar brand. You're certainly not the first person to buy a brand. Um, but, in recent memory, I think that this is something that, you know, for the most part has been really well received and really people got really people excited about it. Now, I actually ran into, as happenstance would have, I actually ran into uh, one of the former owners of Dissident before the show. And uh, and so I, you know, I, I just asked him flat out. I said, so, you know, you know, what do you think about the new direction that Ben's taking the brand and what he's doing? And man, his words couldn't have been, you know, more positive and and more filled with this joy. I mean, this guy was genuinely elated. He was like, I am, I'm excited. I'm excited what he's doing. I'm excited to see where this is going. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's different, but I love it. You know what? So, so, and I actually mentioned this to you previously. So hearing those words from the, 
one of the people who actually started this initially to hear that to see that you've actually taken it a, a completely different direction put your own spin put your own signature on it and it's still resonating with the original people how does that make you feel it makes you feel good you know because i wanted to be respectful to that as well too you know i don't want to uh just completely you know start from straight up scratch you know i mean i wanted to give some homage to what they you know the foundation that they've laid as well so I, i'm i'm I'm, you know, they've they've all been really supportive of it, and you know, and I'm I'm glad I'm 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 grateful that I got their support. You know, because it would be a little bit awkward and different if I didn't. You know, um, but you know, before when I was in the process of you know going through this, you know, I wanted to make sure that they were cool with it, and I, I shared some of the ideas that I had and the direction I wanted with, and they were giving me support then. So um, I'm grateful. So when uh, so I mean, you you started putting out. Like Mark, I mean, like pretty much right when you announced, you started putting out some marketing pieces uh, about it, even with the new logo and stuff. Um, pretty much right from the get. So, um, so you were obviously playing with this for quite some time. This wasn't stuff you, something you obviously churned out overnight and everything. Um, you know, as as you were kind of got the creative juices flowing, as this was more and more likely something that was coming to pass, and got the signature on dotted line, and and you started putting stuff out there. Um, what was the what was some of the initial feedback and response that you were getting from folks and how did that continue to spur you forward i was just getting uh, i was getting tremendous uh support from a lot of people you know there's some retailers i told i was like yeah i'm doing this and um and they were just ecstatic about it you know they, they were all about it and just gave me great words of encouragement there's other ones that gave me really good pointers on things to look at you know um to that and, that and they helped guide me a little bit, you know, watch out for some of these pitfalls, you know, type of thing. Um, so everybody has been, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't ran into anybody that has, has said or done any, you know, or, or displayed any kind of negative feeling about it. Um, everybody has been in my corner with it. And, you know, that's why I think launching at the show, it was just, it, was, it made it so tremendous. Um, you know, I, I was, and I was careful about, you know, how I wanted to release you know, some of the marketing and the teasers that I did and I wanted to do it in a tasteful way, but I also wanted people to know it is coming, you know, this, this is happening. Um, I'm not, there's no turning back now. So, uh, turned out, it turned out really well. Well, you're getting started on the right foot, man, because I got to tell you, um, I know one person who's just absolutely thrilled with you. Uh, and that's because you put out some, you know, solid press releases and that's, that's my partner uh, on the cigar coop primetime special edition, uh, coop who just, uh, um, gets, uh, gets, gets, uh, beside himself with some of these folks who can't manage to put together a decent press release. So he's our, he's already in your corner, man. <laughs> he's already, <laughs> he's, he's a good guy. So I'm glad I could, uh, I could make it easier for him a little bit. Would, uh, so when you, with, uh, with these, with these specific, the soapbox, the, the block and, uh, and the, the home, was this always the initial plan or did, you know, to launch these three at, uh, initially at the same time, where did they come in a different order? Like, did, you know, was there, was there, did everything kind of come together perfectly or, you know, or, cause I know you're working on other stuff too, uh, not without giving, and not, not trying to get too much information out of you, Ben, if you're trying to keep some state secrets here, but you know, you know, was there anything that you planned on releasing or we're going to do that just, you know, needed a little, little extra time. How did that all come together? Now I wanted to start off with Soapbox, Block and Home. I wanted to do it all at once. You know, I didn't want to be one of those brands that releases one line and then months later they release another one and months later they release another one. You know, I wanted to give a good core line um, and I wanted to, you know, do a, a really good limited release as well too. I, w I wanted to do it all at once and I wanted to do it at the Super Bowl of the cigar industry at the trade show. That was always my intent. Um, like I said, James and Angela, they made it happen for me. You know, they, they, we worked very closely on this to make sure that those timelines were met. And, uh, you know, I, I do have some other stuff I want to do. You know, you'll probably see next year some other little projects um, that I'll be working on later on this summer uh, down at Ovea Negra. Um, so I have more coming. You know, I don't want this. It's just not going to stop with these three blends. There's going to be there's more story to tell with Dissident than just a box block and home. So you said so I've always wanted to ask this. And so this, you gave me the perfect in here. You said you knew you wanted to do a limited release. Why? Why do you? Why? Okay, I don't want you to speak for anybody. Why did you so emphatically want to do a limited release? Put something out that only 
a few people could get and a few people smoke. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm grateful because I'm I'm one of those people. I'm smoking it right now. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just I'm just I'm just curious why Benjamin Holt find found a, a limited release to be such a top priority. Um, it's just because of the tobaccos I wanted to use, and I knew the, kind of the availability of them. You know, um, it's just kind of how it. You know, it's just the nature of it. So, uh, I mean, if I could produce this, you know, that cigar regularly, you know, yeah, I probably would. But it's just with some of the tobaccos I'm using. It's 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 just the formula. It's just how it has to has to go roll out. Um, but you know, I also want to take a different approach to limited releases. You know, I'm only making a very certain number of of boxes for uh, for home. Um, I want to do my intent right now is to do it as a twice twice a year uh, limited release. Um, but I want it to be limited. I think you know one thing I've seen in the industry that's kind of frustrating. You know, on the consumer side, is someone says it's limited, but they made you know. 1500 boxes, you know, 5,000 boxes, up to 5,000 boxes, like it's not really limited, you know? Um, <laughs> and I've heard the frustration that some retailers have with that kind of same idea. So, you know, I want to give them, I want to give them something that they've always wanted, you know, in, in, in that, in that structure. But also, you know, there's, there's nerds out there. There's, you know, the cigar nerds out there that, that really grow this industry. You know, I wanted to give them something special too, because I know some of them really like that hunt, you know? Um, and I think, you know, I, I collect vinyl records. One of my favorite things about collecting vinyl records is, is, is the thrill of the hunt for it, you know? So, and I think you got to appreciate it a lot more knowing that it is a rare cigar that, you know, the tobaccos in it are specialized. Um, and when you do get to enjoy it for a special moment, it makes that special moment even better, you know? Well, you, you brought it up, Ben. So now I have to ask, what's your, what's your most prized vinyl that you own? My most, it's actually, it's, this is, it's uh, the Breakfast Club soundtrack. Interesting. Okay. Well, I was hunt, why is that? Because I was hunting down that thing for like almost a year. Um, it's a great soundtrack. Don't get me yeah. wrong. I'm not, yeah, I'm not knocking it. But I, I think it's because of, it's, it's just because of the, the hunt that w went into this. You know, I thought it would be easier to get and it turned out not to be easy. So when I finally got it, which was actually a gift. Uh, as a crisp as a birthday present from Derek, um, he got it for me. I had always kept missing it by two months in, in record stop in shops, and they only made a thousand original pressings of it. Um, mm -hmm. So it, I get, it's just that you know that that trophy that I you know that the the great white buffalo I finally got to slay. <laughs> that might be the first time that someone on the show hasn't used the term unicorn and for <laughs> finding something rare. So the great white buffalo. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm rolling with that, Ben. I'll, I'll credit you. Don't get me wrong. I'll get. I'll give you. I'll give you full credit. But I'm. I'm, I'm taking that because I, I feel like the the term unicorn is is overused in this industry. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like a good. I, you know, you absolutely hit it, man. I, I like a good limited release of someone else. But I, and you hit it again with. I, I think the frustration with it is that not. It's it's not necessarily limited, or it is, and so and then all of a sudden, then oh well, we found more, and it, now it's regular production. Yep, or something yeah. like that. Um, the the model that I like uh, that is is what La Polina has been doing in recent years is they they do basically a tease of a regular production item using it as a TAA. So it's limited to begin with. Yeah. Um, but they they you know with the with an intention at least to possibly make it a you know a full release at the the following year or maybe in a year or two or something like that. So it's um you know so that makes it cool. You kind of get a preview so to speak of it but uh, yeah that was kind of that was kind of frustrating and sometimes when you're like man i i got this 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 box of cigars that you know they only made 1200 of that's it they're never going to make i'm you know i'm one of i'm one of 1200 one of a thousand one of 500 and then all of a sudden it's regular production two years later it's like the most frustrating thing in the world it's like well now man i i could have i didn't have to get this you know? <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah uh and it kind of takes away you know from that I think it takes away from that enjoyment a little bit that specialization and it you know that like i said you know i want it to be used i want people to smoke it in, in special moments and you know and when they're you know frustrated like i you know that's how i got into cigars when i was in iraq and got to decompress it around the smoke pit and enjoy a really good cigar and it takes you back to a you know a, a sense of a mindset of home you know so what were what were you smoking in the service? What got you into cigars, Ben? Let's go back a little bit even further here. Um, yeah, I think it was just really a thing that a lot of us would do, to, you know, to decompress. You know, it was a friend of mine 
had some, and they weren't really great. I can't remember what they were. They were just, I think they were just like, you know, it was Iraq. So there were all these not, Cuban knockoffs or whatever. And but it was just, or Cuban yeah. sandwiches, whatever, you know? Yeah. So it was just something to smoke. And then my dad asked me like, Hey, what can I get you guys out there? You know, besides toiletries and all that stuff, what, what do you guys really want to enjoy? And I was like, a box of cigars would be, you know, great. <laughs> so he sent me a box of uh, original Camacho Connecticut's. Um, okay. And that was really the first cigar that really kind of, I think, opened it up, you know, created, you know, this, this movement for me to move forward with it. So. You know, it's it's interesting you said that because there, I've I've talked to a lot of folks recently. You know, I would say probably, and I say a lot, about half a dozen though, just and and very uniquely, that they got started with the original Camacho. That was the cigar that kind of got them into the 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 world of premium cigars and everything. And that's kind of, you know, with the rebranding that it's gone under Davidoff and everything. And th those cigars have their own place, and and th some of them are still you know fantastic and everything. But you know, the original Camachos, man, I, I, I still remember the original triple Maduro that I smoked and that cigar was just absolutely sensational. Um, and you know, they, that was kind of, that's kind of a, a hidden one that was around for a lot longer than people realize and, and, and got a lot of folks into it and everything. So that's, that's, that's interesting that you bring that up too. So, um, so you, you mentioned a couple projects that you're working on for next year. So what's the plan for the next year? So now you've, you, you, you had the, the Super Bowl. You've done the, you've built this foundation. You've gotten this launch. You've gotten everything off the floor. You've written some of these accounts. You're, you're, you're obviously going to continue to do so. So where does, when, where does Benjamin Holt go from here as far as building Dissident for the rest of 2019? What's the plan? Um, I'm going to add two, uh, two more into the core line. Uh, just my, my idea with it is just do one Vitola of each of these blends. You know, keep down my... My intent with Dissident, I want to keep it small. You know, I, I'm one of those guys that I don't believe you need to have 50 SKUs in your portfolio to be successful. Um, I don't think you need to have a whole bunch of, you know, crazy, ridiculous Vitolas either, you know, um, to, to be successful. I think, you know, retailers find that kind of uh, kind of overwhelming a little bit. So, so do consumers exhausting. as well. Too. Yeah, exhausting. You know, so I want to keep it simple for them to manage. I want to keep it simple for me to manage and be focused. I think if you do that with a smaller, you know, smaller cigars and you concentrate and you focus on those, you get a better product uh, out of it as well too. Um, so yeah, that's my approach. I don't want to be, you know, like I said, I don't want no 50 SKUs and no wall of dissident uh, in, in, in people's humidors or anything. Um, uh, I, I just, I want to produce good cigars that are, in the, in the realm of what anybody can gravitate towards and, and smoke. So is the plan to uh, like, have you, and, and maybe you've already done this, Ben, forgive me. It, like, have you, have you done a strictly a dissident event yet? Not um, yet. Not yet. Those it, will be, those will be coming soon. Um, okay. But, thing so it'll be completely separate, not Oveja Negra brands event with Benjamin Holt who owns dissident. It'll be dissident cigars. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we're planning on doing one uh, Smokers Abbey down in Austin. Come September, we're going to do one down there. Um, you know, spot. Yeah, talked with uh, Vince at B and B up in Philly to do one as well. You know, guys up at Omorita want to do uh, in o Oklahoma City. So yeah, we'll do. We'll, we're going to do some specific uh, dissident events, and then you know we'll also do Oveja Negra events with all the brands and highlighting them as well too. So. So where does your role with Oveja Negra go from here? Um, you know, in the original in the original announcement, you you purchased this brand. You were going to be launching this brand and, and bring it to fruition and everything. But you're still very much a part of and still a representative of Oveja Negra brands. It used to be Boutique United, of course. Um, is is that still the plan going forward, or is there going to be are, are you going to be phasing out of that role with the the main company and just focusing on this? What what's happening there? Yeah, I'll be I'll be phasing out of of the rep role um, here with within the year um, and going strictly into the ownership role and working you know with James Angela and Derek and Scott Zuka on the future of Obey and Negro brands as a whole, you know as well as what you know with Dissident as well too and its role in in, in that. Uh, uh, entity as well, you know, so that's super it's, exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. yeah. So, so will is. your time be, I mean, obviously you'll be on the road quite a bit for promoting it and doing events and things like that, but will you, so that means more time in the factory, right? More time with James yeah. and, and, and Angela and working on all aspects of the business and everything. Yep. And learn, you know, and, and learning more things on that end as well too. You know, uh, I think 
education is a big key in this um, for anybody who owns a cigar brand and you know is in this industry. I think you constantly need to be looking and and educating and growing your knowledge on this. And uh, that's why you know it, it, I'm going to have to step out of the rep role. It's it's there's no way to continue. You know it becomes a really difficult you know juggling game to to do all that. Um, right now it makes sense. Uh, it, it's going very well. I think, uh, you know, we, we also didn't want to, uh, we didn't want to strip me away from retailers that I've got good relationship with, you know, and so it's going to ease, ease into it and then take it to, to the next, to the next level, the next phase of Obey Negro Brands. That's terrific, Ben. Well, Ben, I, I really appreciate your time tonight. I, I'm sure, uh, even though you've had some, a couple of days to unwind, but you've had to Good God, you had, uh, I think you had an event in uh, Arizona already uh, after the, uh, after the, the show went down and everything in your, but you're back home here in Texas. So I really appreciate the time uh, that you were able to give me this evening, but uh, I won't, won't be remiss because I didn't forget our curveball segment. I, I do want to ask a question that I think um, is really weighing on a lot of people's minds um, really heavily um, because this is very important. Um, so between you and James Brown, how many pairs of shoes do you guys absolutely actually own? Probably about 200. Probably about 200. I think James has, well, James probably has about 120 by now, maybe more. And yeah, the remainder is probably me. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm a, ha I'm a hat guy. We talked about this. So I'm, I'm certainly not judging. There's, there's no judgment here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not teasing. I'm not busting your balls. Um, but how did this how did this get started? It's who influenced who, or is it just two shoe guys that just happened to get together and now it's a thing? Well, I mean, I always like shoes, but James' game the shoe game is it's strong. The guy is, <laughs> is a nut for shoes, so I think he was kind of you know uh, the bad influence on me to kind of grow that a little bit more, you know, because we you know we hunt down uh, a lot of old uh, you know a lot of Air Jordans and. You know he has a crazy collection with those, and you know I've been growing mine. I'm a little bit more picky than he is, I think, on the, my Jordan. So that's why he probably has more than me. But uh, yeah, he I think he's he's been the he's been the catalyst. He's been the devil's advocate on 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 me for growing my shoe game. I remember my growing up. My my parents didn't have we didn't have a lot of money, and so buying shoes was usually a before when the school year started event, and it was something you know relatively uh, my parents tried to invest in a good pair of shoes um but i think even back this was back in the 90s obviously um you know they didn't want to spend too much you know 30 40 dollars which just seems obnoxious today right um like obnoxiously cheap today yeah. but you know back then that was a, that was a good pair, pair of decent pair of shoes but even back then jordans were flying off the shelf at you know 100 bucks 125 150 dollars and you know that was that was kind of that was kind of what it. But I really wanted a pair of Jordans, and my mother said that you know if you want a pair of Jordans and you want to spend a hundred dollars on shoes, that's your business, and you can go do it. So uh, it actually became a, a tradition for a while. I've, I've I've since let off of it. I don't really wear high tops as much anymore. Um, but I for my freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year of high school, and then my and then a couple years into college. I would start the year off by buying my own with my own money, buying my own pair of, of Jordans. And, uh, and I remember the first time I've paid a hundred dollars for shoes and it was a pair of Jordans and I can't, I can't tell you the model or anything about them. Uh, they were all white. They had blue outline, but they were real clean looking. Um, and they had that, you know, the, the, the airman on the back. Um, and I just, I just, Oh, I, I, I wore the crap out of those things. There's, I think, I think my, my cause my mother doesn't throw anything away. I think she actually still has them. What's left of them. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, my mom was also a, a master of polishing shoes. So they always looked good until the, until the very bitter end. But those, that was, that was something that was really, Air Jordans are really special to me too. So, um, I don't have quite the collection that you and James have, uh, far from it, but, um, but they, uh, they definitely hold a, a small place in my heart as well. So that's yeah, I think uh, for a lot of kids that grew up that time period, you know, it, it was, it was an iconic shoe, you know, it was, it was that something that you wanted to you strive to get, you know, and you know, that's kind of why I still stick with them. You know, I got a lot of old converses and stuff too. I like, I collect a lot of converses. So, um, I still have quite a bit of those. 
Is there a favorite pair that you have of the of Jordans or or uh, yeah, it's Python? the it's the the band, uh, the Jordan band, the uh, the bread toe. Um, those are my favorite because that was the shoe that you know made Jordan famous. You know, he was fined like five thousand dollars a game for wearing those shoes. You know, so you know that's and I mean I just like the color and the feel of them and and the leather that they have on it. You know, the material that they're made out of. They're awesome. They're my favorite pair. See, a lot of people don't realize that, that, you know, because like in today's day and age, we hear about every little fine, every little hiccup. And we, we lay judgment on these professional athletes and these rock stars and stuff for doing stuff that seems like real tedious and everything. But you know, that, that was something that I remember. In fact, Jordan did not only got fined for the shoes at one point, he was actually getting fined for socks too. Yeah. Cause God forbid he wear black shoes and white socks. Uh, that yep. apparently was just, you don't do that in the, in, in the, in the NBA back then. And it was just this big, he got fined for it. I was, and I, I just remember reading like, cause like when, when I was a kid and we would read the paper, yes, we read the paper back then. Um, I dating myself a little bit, but yeah, I was also probably uh, a little, a little old guy. Uh, even as a teenager, I read the paper every morning, but I remember anytime you saw find or suspended, it was, it was an even bigger deal than today. Yeah. You know, it, it kind of painted somebody like, you know, you immediately painted them as just a, just a bad guy. You didn't want to root for that guy or anything like that. But, but suddenly Jordan gets fined for, for shoes and socks. And it's just like, that, this yeah, is just stupid. That was like the aha moment for me as a kid. Like, this is just stupid. It compared <laughs> to what people are getting, you know, fined and, and suspended for today. Right. Like, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and then appealing and then getting even less suspension for, for some pretty, pretty heinous oh, stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just, it's, it's just an, yeah, it's such a it's such a blip on on what was actually what truly was a a legacy of an amazing amazing career. Uh, arguably, I think he's the best player to ever play. I do too. Um, I think you know I I remember when I first got uh, I used to collect you know sports cards and stuff like that too. And I remember I was always hunting for for you know Jordan's card, and I finally got it, and I was just ecstatic to have it. I think I still have it somewhere. But I think my mom has all my my old card collection back home somewhere. Like I said, my mother throws nothing away, so she's got most of my card collection. I have a pretty extensive collection here at my home as well. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll never. I, I that's something I'm excited to pass on to my to my sons, and you know, like they 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 may not even they get it. They probably will think it's stupid, but you know, I you know for a long for a long time from when we were kids, um, you know, card collecting was a big deal. You know, these guys yeah. were you know it was. You know, we could memorize their stats and stuff like that. Now you can Google it on a phone and it's, it's just not as cool. It's not as yeah. cool. <laughs> so, well, Ben, thank you so much for your time this evening. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, you know, Sunday is always a personal day for most people. And that's why I do it on this evening because I catch most people at home. Um, and are, we're able to do this fantastic show with great takes with fantastic guests, just like you. Uh, but I also realize that this is time taken away from your family. You're, you're actually at your sister's place. I'm taking away from personal time. And so I greatly appreciate you sitting down with me uh, this evening and, uh, and sharing a part of uh, part of your story, the very beginning of what will be a great legacy with dissident. I am absolutely sure. So, well, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the support. And I hope you keep enjoying that, that home. Absolutely. I'm, I'm definitely going to be uh, sitting in here a while smoking this. This is uh, this is, this is fantastic. So well done on this. So, so everyone out there, appreciate all your likes, shares, comments. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, really appreciate everything. Now, remember, if you are listening to us, wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that be Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, Google Play, TuneIn, Podbean, wherever you listen to podcasts, make sure that you subscribe and leave a review. And, uh, and when you do that, remember that we are you are listening to us exclusively because of Cornelius and Anthony premium cigars. We really appreciate everyone out there for tuning in on a Sunday evening. We hope everyone had a fantastic independence day and there are going to be many more takes to come. So stay tuned for our 82nd take. We'll have a guest information coming up on that as well. Plus I'll be releasing special interviews from IPCPR 2019. And here's a little bit of a tease. If you guys have been living under a rock, this was the last year of IPCPR next year will be PCA. So tune in for all the details on that and from some fantastic interviews that I had with some of the industry's finest individuals like my esteemed guest this evening. We appreciate you all out there. And for everyone, I'm Barry Duplissy. This was our 81st take sitting with Dissident's own Benjamin Holt. And guess what, guys? We'll see you next time.